The Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka, the country's apex think tank on socio-economic policy issues, has been publishing the State of the Economy report since 1992 with a complementary theme selected each year. This year, the report looks at Sri Lanka's transition to a middle-income economy and which areas require particular policy attention in order to facilitate this transition. After posting impressive growth rates of over 8% in the two years following the end of the conflict, growth in 2012 moderated to 6.4%. Following economic overheating in the second half of 2011, evidenced mainly by a rapidly expanding trade deficit, the government undertook a series of adjustment measures in early 2012. As 2012 progressed, the country saw a sharp decline in both exports and imports. The former was due to the weak health of destination markets of Sri Lanka's exports and the lower prices of key commodities like cotton and rubber, which depressed export prices. The latter was due to the rupee depreciation, tighter credit conditions, and duty hikes, which curbed import demand, and also lower world commodity prices. Much of Sri Lanka's post conflict growth to date has been concentrated in non-tradable sectors, notably in construction, retail, tourism, and foreign worker remittance. With the return of peace and the massive reconstruction drive which has followed, it is natural to see non-tradables receiving a post-war boost. Literature, however, suggests that countries which successfully navigated the middle-income transition have seen their tradable sectors grow much faster than their non-tradables. Energy is an essential component of driving Sri Lanka's export growth. With rising costs of electricity, it is very essential that Sri Lanka places a significant amount of consideration on energy-efficient production processes as well as renewable energy. It is clear that Sri Lanka cannot keep postponing bold and essential reforms to the energy sector. Evidence from both domestic and international sources suggests a strong relationship between electricity supply and economic growth. Sri Lanka's ambitions of rapid growth towards middle income status would certainly be hampered by insufficient and costly energy supply. Household expenditure patterns suggest that electricity consumption is highest among those in the middle class income group. A growth in this group would no doubt put additional pressure on energy resources. In order to cater to rising energy demands and increasing levels of expenditure by the rising middle class, it is essential that the government pays attention to securing the necessary investments. In this respect, revenue generation is a top priority. On the revenue side, taxation continues to be a concern. Recognizing the taxation imperative in fiscal consolidation, the government appointed a presidential taxation commission in 2009. Sri Lanka is increasingly investing in physical infrastructure. These forms of physical infrastructure are important to drive export-led growth in a post-war context. While revenue generated by taxation is invested in physical infrastructure, it is far from sufficient. Hence, there is a need for public-private partnerships in infrastructure development. Mobilizing private capital for public projects isn't easy, and recent experience from India amply demonstrates this. Despite their huge infrastructure financing need, private investors and private capital have been put off by the tenuous processors and doing business with the state over concerns uh, around corruption. Now this holds important lessons for Sri Lanka as well in attracting private capital for our infrastructure needs. While physical infrastructure is essential for economic growth and Sri Lanka's transition to middle income status, social infrastructure should also be developed at the same time. Sri Lanka is continuing to reap the benefits of impressive investments in education and health in the post-independence period. However, the transition to middle-income status brings with it new challenges to human development. In 2012, Sri Lanka's public expenditure on education was 1.8% uh, of GDP. However, the average upper-middle-income country spends 5% of GDP and the average lower-middle-income country spends 4% of GDP on education. The effects of Sri Lanka's waning demographic dividend are already manifesting itself in labor force participation rates. 7% fewer young people were in the labor force in 2010 compared to 2006. This means that with the demographic dividend on its way out, Sri Lanka is expecting to reach upper middle income status and beyond, with fewer people working to get there. This means greater investment in education and skills development, so that the smaller cohort of young people still in the labor force generates more output per person. 
With middle income status come changes in the aspirations of youth with regard to the type of employment they seek. It is essential that workers are equipped with necessary skills in order to meet emerging income opportunities. At the same time, it is important to create a safety net for the poorest and those most likely to be left out. While the poverty reduction has been impressive in Sri Lanka, a significant share of households are clustered just above the poverty line, which means various shops could easily push them back into poverty. There are a multitude of social protection programs currently operating, but they provide insufficient benefits or they are poorly targeted or they do not cover the risks and vulnerabilities adequately. This is most evident in the country's largest program, Samudhi. The maximum amount of income transfer delivered by Samudhi to a household is 1,500 rupees, while the national poverty line dictates that a person requires at least 3,300 rupees per month to meet his or her consumption needs. Better targeting in social protection schemes like Samudhi can free up more funds to give to those who most need it. Social protection schemes must uh, expand coverage to include emerging risks due to natural disasters. Uh, also, a big part of uh, protecting against natural disasters is to have better information and uh, to provide that information to those who need it. Climate information products in this regard can help the vulnerable groups uh, to make better decisions and uh, be better prepared to face the uh, adverse impacts of natural disasters. Overall, Sri Lanka is facing new challenges as it makes the transition to a middle-income economy. A key characteristic of other economies that have made or are in the process of making this change is a growing global middle class and the acknowledgement that this can have positive impacts on growth and development. The best means of growing this middle class is to strengthen what is at the heart of their emergence, access to secure, well-paying employment opportunities. This means that Sri Lanka must focus on expanding tertiary education and vocational training. The rising socio-economic prosperity in Sri Lanka, if fostered cleverly and inclusively with progressive public policies, can spur economic dynamism, innovation and social progress and place the country on firmer ground as it makes a decisive transition into a middle-income economy and beyond.